Good morning. How's my frozen family this morning? <laughs> yeah, I have to put up with that all the time. You're right. You're absolutely right. Well, there are a lot of you here this morning. I thought we would be a little bit, uh, a little bit lower in numbers considering the weather. Of course, we don't have the ice. The other day I went to the store to get groceries and there were just a few things and there wasn't a few things there. In Texas, if there's a storm coming, the bread and the milk is going away along with the eggs. It just disappears. That's kind of how it was the other day. So there are more of you here than I expected. You know, with all that ice and stuff, it reminded me of a story that was told about a, a preacher that had a little bitty old church out in the country and it snowed and it snowed and it snowed and he, he was going to make it there, you know. That's what the preacher does. He's going to be there just in case somebody shows up. And one old farmer showed up for the preaching. And he looked down at him. He sat right on the front row, and he said, Man, you're the only guy here. But uh, he said, Do you want me to go ahead with it? He asked the farmer, and the farmer said, Well, if I go to feed my cows and only one shows up, I go ahead and feed them. So the preacher said, Okay. So he started to preach, and he preached. And he preached, and he preached. For over two hours, he preached. So after he was done, he asked the farmer, he said, what do you think? He said, well, if all my cows, show, he goes, if I went to feed my cows and they showed up, I'd feed them. But if one showed up, I wasn't going to feed him the whole bag. <laughs> so this morning, I'll try not to feed you all the whole bag, okay? You know, we saw some pretty interesting things during all this ice that were Cars parked everywhere, and people can't get up hills, and they're sliding off in ditches and everything like that. And talking to one guy that his car got to slide, and he said, "My, my life flashed right before my eyes, right before I hit that pole." And I said, "Well, maybe, maybe that it wasn't your life. Maybe you're looking for God. You know, He's, you know, we get in those situations, and sometimes that's one of the things it does." So. This morning, I found a little story I want to read to you. It says, one day a kindergarten teacher told everyone to draw a picture of what was important to them. In the back of the room, Johnny began labor over his drawing. Everyone else finished and handed in their picture, but he didn't. He was still drawing. The teacher graciously, graciously walked back and put her arm around Johnny's shoulder and said, Johnny, what are you drawing? He didn't look up. He just kept on working feverishly at his picture. He said, I'm drawing God. But Johnny, she said gently, no one knows what God looks like. He answers, they will when I'm through. <laughs> Amen. Think about that. What does God look like? Does anybody know? What does God truly look like? Can someone confess to that this morning what they think? Well, let's turn to our Bibles this morning, and we're going to look for the answer in our Bibles this morning. So we're going to be on a good bit of Scripture today, so I pray you brought your Bible with you. I want you to look at God's word, not mine, and uh, see if we can't figure some of this out this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 14, beginning at verse 8. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 8. Verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So they're confused right here. They, I, I, I'm sure this is a, a question that went on, and they didn't even consider it that way. But now I want to bring you the same scripture to you, the exactly the same scripture, but I want to bring it to you cowboy style, as uh, shared by pastor of the Cowboy Church of Tarrant County, Mel Hooten. In fact, Mel's devotional uh, contributed a little bit to this sermon this morning, but he does it in the cowboy way, and I thought this was pretty good to get the point across. John chapter 14, verse 8, the cowboy way. Philip said to him, Lord, just show us the Father, and we will be plumb, that will plumb be all we need. Jesus told him, Philip, I've been with you for quite a spell. How is it you don't recognize me? Anyone who has laid eyes on me has for sure seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? 
Have you ever wondered, truthfully, have you ever wondered what God looks like? Ever wondered about that? He has probably been described in many various ways depending on each person's view. Everybody might have a different view. Some would describe him as very old with white hair and dressed in a long white robe probably, while others may think he just looks normal. People try to describe God, but they have a little bit of uh, trouble doing that. But have any of you ever tried to vision a physical image of God's appearance? Vision it. Because we're made in the image of God, amen? So it gives us all this, uh, uh, I'd say, wondering about what God would truly look like. You know, would he be old? Would he be young? Uh, you know, would we be able to know who he was if we saw him? The truth is that we can't actually put any physical characteristics, characteristics. Thank you, man. My uh, script writer there. Uh, to God, we can't put any characteristics to God. Reason being is because God is not a physical being; He's a spirit. So it's hard to put any of that to Him. John chapter four, verse twenty-four. Jesus speaking right here. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and its worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. Right there, it tells us that God is a spirit. The Bible also shares with us that no one has ever seen God except, except his son, Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God except. And y'all go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That can't be true because Moses was on the mountain, right? Surely Moses saw him. Surely Abraham saw him. He talked to him a lot. Are you sure you know what you're talking about there, Reg? Is that true? Well, John chapter 1, verse 18. And remember, this comes right out of the Bible. This is the inspired word of God. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So the Bible backs that up. No one, no one except his Son has ever seen God. Amen? Even Moses, even Moses who spoke face to face, and the Bible tells us that Moses spoke face to face with God, but was not allowed to see God. Spoke face to face. Let's look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 33, verse 7. Thirty-three, seven. And many people I know in their reading, they assumed, unless you really read and you understand, they assumed that when Moses spoke to God, he was able to see God. And what God looked like. But remember, God spoke to him through a burning bush. So it was, in the, it was through spirit. And that's, that's, why that, that's why we're not, we can't put that physical part on, on God to know what he truly would look like. We can imagine it. We can, we can do any of that. But to truly know, no one has ever seen God except the Son, which is Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 33, verse 7. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood up stood in worship, each at the entrance of their, their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So it tells us right there that go, right here, Moses spoke to him face to face. And you go, how's that work? He can't see him, but he still speaks to him face to face. And I think he's meaning it's one-on-one. -on -one. Right? It's not necessarily physically face to face. But even though Moses is standing in God's presence on Mount Sinai and requested, Moses even requested to see God in all his glory, he was not allowed to do that. But he did request it. Let's look at uh, Exodus. We're on 33. Drop on over there to verse 18.
Exodus uh, chapter 33, verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory, when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So basically Moses got to see him walking away, all right? He got to see the backside, but he didn't get to see who he was. Didn't get to see him in the physical, because it says no one has ever seen God and lived except Jesus Christ, and he was God. Even today, and you have to agree with me, and some of us, uh, some of us may not uh, look at it that way, but many Christians would jump at a chance to see what good like God looked like in the physical body. They really would. And some people go, well, I don't, I don't want to go there. You know, but I think we would. And Philip and the disciples, they may, may have just stood there in shock, total shock. By Jesus' answer, there in the upper room on the night of his betrayal when Jesus told them, that they had already seen the Father. So I'm sure they were in shock. What, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, but if you look back at John 14, chapter 9, once again, Jesus speaking here. How can you say, show us the Father when you're looking at him? Amen? It's the same thing. And, and I think, I think they, that probably was shocking to them because they believed through this whole thing that Jesus was the Son of God, but they weren't putting it together that he was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They weren't putting all that together. So they wanted to see a physical being of the Father separate from Jesus. If we are by faith this morning a child of God, we've already seen God. Amen? If we want to know what God looks like, then we just need to look at Jesus. That simple. If we want to know the sound of God's voice, then we just need to look at John chapter 10, verse 27. Let's go there. Jesus speaking here once again. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus speaking, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and, I, and they follow me. You know, and that's an interesting thing right there is, is he says, they listen to me. I know them, and they know me, and they follow me. My sheep listen to my voice. You go, how does that work? Well, we can listen in various ways. We can listen through God's word right here in our Bible. We can pray. And be still and listen. We can hear God's voice, maybe not audibly, but in spirit and in, in our hearts and our minds, if we take the time to be still and listen. So a true faithful believer in God will truly listen for God's voice. And if we want to know the thoughts of God, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. And we should have the mind of Christ. We should be like Christ, amen? But have the mind of Christ, we know there's a God. And we should be able to think about that. When we start to picture God, the, just these two things that we've already talked about, his voice and we think like him are strive to think like God, 
then, then we grow closer to God. We grow closer, closer to knowing what we believe that person to look like. But go back and think about the same thing once again. We are made in the image of God. So does God look like us? Well, the Bible's not clear about that because no one's ever seen God. But it is a curiosity thing, right? And we know Jesus came down and, and he was in human form. And he looked like us, maybe a little different. And from the pictures, you know, we, we know he's closer to us than, than anything else we've seen, right? So we kind of got to, we've kind of got to look at the scriptures to understand what God would truly look like. And if we want to know the extent of God's love, look at his sacrifice of his son. John 3, 16, for God loved the world that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, remember that, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. These three pieces of scripture describe God. You go, well, maybe it didn't for you. But if you truly consider the scriptures, we can get what God would look like to us in the human flesh by when Jesus walked on the earth, by his personality, by his love, by his grace, by his demeanor, all that. We know that. We read it in the scriptures. We know Jesus was a little low-key until you made him mad, right? And he didn't get mad that often. And I think when he did, it was for the right reasons, amen? But he's pretty low-key. And I think that's what we can look at when we say, hey, what does God look like? Well, he's pretty laid back until you, until you do something wrong, and then he's forgiving. But if you continue, we know through the Bible, God... <laughs> He did a lot of things. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. He had enough. So that kind of tells me that we can mimic God, but God didn't want to mimic us. Amen. We can be in this likeness, but to me, through the things that are described in the Bible of God's love for us, I think we can picture what God looks like. I think we can picture what kind of person he would be. There's a difference between evil and, and good, and there's a difference between right and wrong. And I think that when you get someone that's just right all the time, we can't ever mimic that, amen? But we can strive. Remember the word? We can strive to do that. You know, God's fingerprints can be de detected all through history. All through history, if we just look for them. At times, his work was obvious to us, and it is today. His work is obvious to us in a lot of ways, like the parting of the Red Sea we read about, right? That's God's fingerprints right there. Or tearing down the walls of Jericho, that's God's fingerprints. And all through the Bible, there's examples of God's fingerprint all through history. But if you don't get into God's Word, you wouldn't know that. And those are the things that give us the, a vision of God. And then there are times that things, they're not so obvious, are noticeable to us that God does. Sometimes, and I say it this way, we notice the things that when there's, you know, there's things are complicated and when things are going south for us and, you know, we might notice God in some of that. We might even call out to God, but God's in the little things that we miss sometimes. In the simplest things that we overlook, God is right in the middle of that. But we think God will always be in the midst of the big things going on. And that's not true. I think God is more in the little things than he is in the big things. Jesus wasn't a showboat. Why does God have to be? You either believe or you don't. But it's real that, that simple one. And I think sometimes that if we would just take the time in our lives just to slow down a little bit and seek God, read, read his word, seek God, and get closer to God. The relationship means a whole lot. You know, we might lose God in a crowd, but he'll never lose us in a crowd, right? And that's a good thing. Because you know what that's like when you get out in a crowd. I lose my wife all the time. That's not, that's, that's, that's pretty simple, right? I mean, but you know what? I'll tell you this. I can lose my wife in a store. I can lose my wife in a store, but I know her voice. And I can find her just like that. And that's what God's saying, Right? Got you back, didn't I? <laughs> but that's a good vision, right? That's that what that's why God's telling us. If you know my voice, 
Even though we don't see him, it doesn't mean God's not working. And it doesn't mean his activities are hindered in any way just because we don't see him. He's still there every day. God keeps working whether we're aware of it or not. Blessing comes to those who are spiritually attuned to what God is doing. Are you? Are you spiritually attuned to what God's doing? Do you actually know what God's doing or where God's leading you in your life? Do you know what his will is for your life? God has a will for each and every one here this morning. Every one of you. And he's given each and every one of us a gift. And we know that. But wait a minute, I don't have a gift. Yes, you do. God give each and every one of us a gift. The question is, do you know what the gift is and are you using it? Once again, that needs to be sought out through God's word. Reading our Bibles helps a whole lot. You can read the Bible through, and I have twice. Totally read the, read the Bible through twice. And I can sit down and start to read any piece of Scripture, and I will find something in that Scripture that I missed when I read it the first or second time. There's always something you'll miss because there's so much information. There's so many little things that we get, we look over. If you think about Ray Perriman, I don't know if you know Ray Perriman. Ray Perriman can take three words in a piece of scripture and he can make a whole sermon out of it. Because he looks for the little things that are in there. He looks for the things that a lot of people miss in there. And that's the way we should be also. And we can have peace and hope in our hearts by just knowing that God is at work for us today and every day. Our faith grows because of, more than anything else, his activity in our lives. That's what grows our faith. When we find ourselves in situations, you know, sometimes I say you have to fall all the way to your knees before you'll start reaching, you'll start reaching up. And sometimes that's what it takes. But then again, for some it doesn't. They call on God every day. Pray every day. You know, you go, wait, wait a minute. I, I don't know. How do I talk about it? How, how do I do that? You know, I'm not good at praying. You're good at talking to people, I'm sure. Maybe not like Reg where you get up there and blabber all the time. But you know what I'm saying. You're good. You, you can speak to people. Well, if you can speak to your neighbor, you can speak to your friend, you can speak to God in the same way. It's that simple. Rub-a-dub-dub, thank you for the grub. Right? That's a blessing for lunch, supper, whatever, right? It's that simple. God knows your heart, and that's all that matters. He knows who you are. Can we see God as he works in our lives today? Can we truly see that? Do we look for God as he works in our lives? You see, our relationship with God is not by sight. That's irrelevant. It's by faith. By faith in it more than anything else. The second time Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room in his resurrected body, he showed his nail-scarred hands to Thomas. Thomas wanted proof. You know, he wanted to see something. So Jesus didn't mind. He said, okay, here you go. But still at that time, Thomas, he was a little... A little skeptical up to that point. You know, and, and these guys are, are, are guys that walked with Jesus, seen the miracles, seen the things he did. They became like buddies everywhere they went, you know. They knew Jesus. Yet some of them were stretched in faith and had their faith stretched in the same way. John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus speaking to Thomas right here. Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. The bottom line truth here, right here, is we don't have to see to believe. The Apostle Paul said it like this. For we live by faith, not by sight. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We live by faith, not by sight. you'll find that many people want positive proof. They even want a miracle. They want to see a miracle from God. 
When I get people like that, I say, you are the miracle. You're here, amen? You are the miracle. So what else do you need to see? We can see God if we just look. We truly can. We can even imagine what he would look like in a physical body if we choose to do that because our mind will allow it. But our very best option is to understand who God is and what he mean, what it means for us to have a personal relationship with him despite not seeing him physically. That's our best option. Believe in him. Believe in him. And understanding how important we are to God, we're so important that he sent his son to die for us, that he loved us that much. And he seeks us every day. He's, he doesn't give up. I mean, he's just after us. He's after everybody. And he's not going to give up because the Bible's pretty clear. He doesn't want anybody left behind. But there are going to be some left behind. People go, why would such a gracious, loving God send someone to hell? That's not going to happen. Well, he's not grading on the curve, right? You either believe or you don't. People go, well, I know that person. They got saved and they got baptized and, man, they, they act terrible. They don't even act like that. Did they really get saved? Well, they, I mean, baptism's great. We're glad they went through all that. But we don't know. Only they know in their heart if they accepted Jesus Christ. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering about that, when I accepted Christ, did I really accept Christ? I still messed up after I accepted Christ. Sure you did, and you will again. But do you know how to repent? You know what that word means? Stop it. That's what it means. It doesn't mean just do it every once in a while. It means stop it. That's repent. That means I'm, I'm done with it. I'm not going to do it anymore, right? So you have to work that out. But God loves us that much that he's not going to let up on us. He's going to stay after us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made of what was visible. Many people, as we read about in the Bible, Moses, Abraham, many, many more. When they went and did what they were asked to do, they did it by faith. Not by demand or not by anything else. They did it because their faith was strong enough to believe in something that they couldn't see or touch. But their faith was so strong that they followed the will of God. And when they did, God protected them and God blessed them. And God looked after them through the whole thing. And they came out so much stronger on the other side. If we look at Job, think about all the things that happened to Job. Job, he just wanted to throw up his hands and just be done with it. You know, that's that in most people, you think that's what Job was. Now, Job's wife wanted to do that for him. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? That's the wife I'm looking for, right? Everybody needs one of them. <laughs> I don't mean that about you. I know you're not that way. <laughs> but she said that to him. He didn't give up. He didn't care. He held on to his faith. He knew God's will was in his life, and he knew God had a purpose for him. And think about it. On the other side, he came out better than he was when this all started. Same thing applies to us. The question this morning would be to you, how strong is your faith? You can have... You know, you can have really strong faith or you can have really weak faith. It's all in your hands. You have a choice. That's why God gave us a mind. Can you see God's hand in everything that goes on, everything we do? It's there if we just look. Get yourself out of the busy world. Slow your life down a little bit. 
Look around. God's everywhere. And if you can't answer yes to these two questions, then I'd recommend you study your Bible a little bit harder as to have God reveal to you in the way only he can do through faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. Father, we are thankful that you're involved in everything. Father, we're thankful that you give us a choice. Father, I pray that we uh, seek you and that we make the right choices, Father. From time to time, we know we fall down, Father. We know you're a forgiving, loving God. Father, I pray this morning that you look after each and every one here today. We're thankful that they took the time to come here, Father, being praised to you. Father, we're thankful for this band that lifts us up, gets our hearts pumping, and gets us excited about you, Father. And Father, we're thankful for your message. Father, we, uh, we'd be lost without you, and many are. Father, today I pray that uh, there's someone out there lost, Father, that uh, they would seek you. If they wonder about that physical thing, that they'd seek you through your word, Father, that your spirit's there with them. Father, this morning I pray that everything we did, everything we said, was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.